Coming up on We Talk News This Week in Washington, D.C., Republicans and Democrats agree on a resolution that Russia should release three Americans now behind bars. That includes former teacher Mark Fogel, who is in prison there since 2021 on a cannabis possession charge. Meanwhile, in Colombia, the legalization movement has been halted after the Senate couldn't get enough votes to pass that proposed constitutional amendment. And the NCAA will decide in the fall if they will take cannabis off drug testing requirements for its collegiate athletes. After a key competition and medical committee deemed the plant medicine is not performance enhancing. And Jim Belushi for Senate? The Oregon grower, actor, and advocate is asking his followers on social media if he should enter politics. He would have our vote for sure. All that and state-by-state state cannabis news on Weed Talk News next. We are pro-cannabis media. Hi, everyone. Welcome to We Talk News for this week. I'm the founder of Pro Cannabis Media, Jimmy Young, filling in for Elena Pinto, who is off on vacation and will be back on July 14th. Now, one of the most powerful organizations in this country is the NCAA. They govern athletics amongst all of their member schools, universities, and colleges in this nation. Now, a panel on the competitive safeguards and medical aspects of sports has concluded that testing should be limited to performance enhancing drugs. Furthermore, they conclude that cannabis is not in this category. So that competition and medical aspects committee is recommending to remove cannabis from drug testing for the entire NCAA. Now, that whole organization will need to approve this before it is enacted and that vote won't happen until this fall. Checking on federal reform in the Washington, D.C. area on a regular basis is our own reporter in D.C., Andrew Berenger. Hello, this is Andrew Berenger reporting from Washington, D.C. for We Talk News. In federal news, updates regarding recent developments in the Biden administration's stance on cannabis policy and scheduling. Advocates are pushing for a more comprehensive solution, the descheduling of cannabis altogether. Over 80 organizations have come together urging the Biden administration to end the federal prohibition of cannabis and support comprehensive reform. Now, previously on October 6, 2022, an announcement was made from the Biden administration signaling a significant shift in the approach to federal cannabis possession cases. The administration decided to pardon simple federal cannabis possession cases for certain individuals urging and hopeful that state governors would follow suit and also consider pardoning cannabis cases. Now, these developments underscore the ongoing discussion and debates surrounding cannabis policy in our country. The Biden administration's actions to reassess and reevaluate the current regulatory framework amplifies the growing momentum for comprehensive reform in the United States. Also, in a rare showing of bipartisan support for anything, the U.S. House of Representatives recently unanimously approved a resolution expressing support for Americans incarcerated in Russia, including a U.S. citizen serving a 14-year sentence for possessing medical cannabis legally obtained in Pennsylvania. This measure, introduced by Representative Michael McCall of Texas, received overwhelming support, passing with a vote of 422 to zero. Officials highlighted the case of this individual, stating that his charges parallel those faced by Brittany Griner, an American basketball player imprisoned in Russia recently due to possession of vape cartridges containing cannabis oil. Now, finally... And exciting news awaits as we gear up for a significant milestone in Maryland's cannabis market. Now, I don't know if you remember, but starting July 1st, adult use cannabis will be legal for individuals aged 21 and above. So what does that mean? Well, with a valid government ID, such as driver's license, passport, or military ID, you will have the legal right to purchase and possess cannabis products from registered dispensaries across the state. Also, for those with a green thumb, you'll be pleased to know that starting July 1st, each person can grow up to two cannabis plants with a maximum 
of four cannabis plants permitted per household. And those interested in entering the industry, mark your calendars. In September of this year, applications for new licenses will open, providing an opportunity to contribute to Maryland's thriving cannabis market. Get ready, Maryland. Starting July 1st, cannabis is legal. Well, that will do it for me in the DC area report for this week. And once again, I am Andrew Berenger reporting for We Talk News. Out west in California, that state continues to struggle with the battle between legacy and legal markets. Overregulation, high taxes, and lack of banking continues to wreak havoc in the nation's number one cannabis market. A major distributor, Herbal, is now in receivership. Lavana Vassa has our California Cannabis Report for this week. I'm Lavana Vassa, and this is what's happening in the California cannabis industry right now. On June 20th, the California Department of Cannabis Control announced allocating almost $4 million in funding to 18 new local jurisdictions to expand access to licensed cannabis retail in a first-of-its-kind program. But the question is, will this make a difference in the struggling California cannabis industry that is facing what some have called a mass extinction event? Last year, two of the biggest national cannabis brands, Massachusetts-based Cureleaf and Florida-based Trueleaf, closed up shop on their California operations, indicating an overregulated, overtaxed, and climate change stressed California cannabis market. And now it's apparent that another major player in the California industry has died off. Although officially unconfirmed by anyone directly from the company, it looks like one of the biggest California distributors, Herbal, is failing. In the past week or so, several former employees have been saying farewell to the company on LinkedIn, and several publications have pontificated on the company officially going under. Then yesterday, the North Bay Business Journal reported in an article on their website that, quote, a sign dated June 15th on the Coffee Park front gate at 3158 Condo Court reads, notice to pay rent or surrender possession of the premises. It continues with the request from Siri Property Management Santa Rosa for back rent totaling more than $20,400 and that the cannabis company that raked in $700 million in sales in 2022, according to MarketWatch, has until Thursday to respond or first face a formal eviction. The article also reported that the building was locked up and appeared to be closed for business. In other news, the Bay Area continues to be plagued by dispensary robberies. On Tuesday, SF is reported three robberies of cannabis dispensaries and businesses occurred, occurred in one night in Oakland. In one of the incidences, the thieves used a forklift to ram their way into the dispensary and rob it. The reason why thieves have been targeting dispensaries is because there is still no federal legalization and therefore most banks won't do business with cannabis businesses, forcing them to hold large amounts of cash. The Safe Banking Act has been slowly making its way through legislation and if passed would hopefully solve this devastating issue. This has been the California Cannabis Industry Update. I'm Lavana Vassal reporting for Pro Cannabis Media. Right next to California is Nevada. And that state continues to be one of the most cannabis friendly with some hotels embracing the culture already. And now the governor there has changed some of the laws to make them even more friendly to the consumer. Governor Joe Lombardo approved laws to increase the limit on purchases and possession to 2.5 ounces and concentrates double from an eighth to a quarter of an ounce. The law also allows the existing adult use licensees to sell to medical patients as well. Las Vegas and Clark County will have social consumption lounges first, and they could be operational by this fall. Consumption is not a problem in the state of Missouri, where they continue to set sales records for a new market. Brandon Jones has our Missouri report sponsored by Baker Brands. What's up, everybody? It's Brandon Jones with B Green Distribution with Missouri Cannabis Report for Weed Talk News. And that's right, consumption, not an issue here in Missouri. Neither are sales. But yeah, the pop, we're having some consumption lounges actually starting to pop up all over the city here. They are sometimes are going to be there for long term, and we're seeing a lot of little pop-up consumption events happening all over the city. Uh, the biggest one that I couldn't believe actually happened was Boulevardia. So Boulevardia was put on by Boulevard, our biggest craft brewery company here in the Kansas City area. They have a national distribution. And one of the VIP sponsors was a cannabis company. So downtown Kansas City, Mayor Quentin Lucas playing the tambourine, dancing around with the music. 
having smoke on one side and a VIP trailer for cannabis at the biggest craft brew event, beer event in Kansas City. It was pretty crazy. So we are really starting to see cannabis get involved and intertangled in all of the mainstream events here in Kansas City now, as long as we're on the Missouri side. Please stay away from the Kansas side, as I had to go on this last week from downtown Kansas City to Kansas City, Kansas, to watch my buddy, uh, Mr. Mac Mo Green, fight in an MMA fight. And I had to make sure that I had a buddy meet me somewhere to make sure all of my stuff did not travel across the state line, if you know what I mean. Kansas is still crazy, so have to be careful if you're having events, even if they're in the same city. Sometimes you're crossing a state line and you could be breaking the law. So be careful here in Kansas City when you're jumping from event to event. Make sure you're still in Missouri. Other than that, consumption is great. In Kansas, no, 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 no. Be careful. So, yes, events are going great. Cannabis is great in the state of Missouri. And sales are going awesome. So, we're just really excited to be here. Come down, check out all the events. There's going to be many, many more. I know on July 8th, Dab Stars is having one. And then obviously 710. We know there's going to be tons of events for Concentrate Day. So I'm Brandon Jones with Be Green Distribution for the Missouri Cannabis Report for We Talk News. Stay educated and medicated. Have a great week. Brandon Jones, Missouri Cannabis Report is brought to you by Baker Brands, a curated B2B marketplace for head shops and dispensaries. In Vermont, Jesse Lynn Dolan is off this week, but there was a significant part of the bill that Jesse Lynn told us about last week that we want to continue to talk about. So this Vermont Cannabis Report is sponsored by Canatrol, the best drying and curing process in the industry. Governor Phil Scott let some significant changes become law last week without his signature. He allowed that the state to open up its own independent testing lab that will now be allowed to do random testing of products to ensure their quality and cannabinoid makeup. He also increased the amount of THC allowed to be grown in products from 50 milligrams of THC to 100. And he increased the amount of plants people can grow at home in Vermont from 9 to 12. Now, one other thing in that new bill is that a propagation license is available now that will allow growers the opportunity to sell clones to other licensees. So it's not just about seeds anymore. That's the abridged Vermont Cannabis Report, sponsored by Canatrol. The Vermont Cannabis Report is supported by another Green Mountain business, Canatrol, winner of High Times Best Dry Cure System. Check them out at canatrolls.com. Louisiana Governor John Bell Edwards has signed a new bill into law that eases state penalties for possession and expungement. First-time offenders of cannabis possessions will have 90 days to get their records expunged. That's down from five years. Court costs have also been capped at $300. Now, in that state, it's progress, and the law passed with a bipartisan vote. Out in Arizona, expungement is always an important part of any new law, and the Grand Canyon state has a vibrant market since its inception. Now it looks like they're going to continue to do the right thing, and here's Karen Black with her Arizona Cannabis Report. I'm Karen Black with Greenfinger Consulting. Welcome to the Arizona Cannabis Report for Weed Talk News. Several Arizona marijuana products, two from True Infusion and four from Cannabis, have been voluntarily recalled this month due to possible contamination by Aspergillus and Salmonella. Auditors for the Arizona Department of Health Services found what they are calling potential false results reported by a licensed testing laboratory. The manufacturers worked with the state agency and retailers to remove the products from shelves out of caution. There have been no reports of associated illness to date. More information can be found on the Arizona Department of Health Services website. There's been a lot of buzz these past couple weeks about a two-year-old cannabis cultivation facility based at what was once North America's largest underground copper mine in San Manuel, Arizona, a small town northeast of Tucson. The 100,000-square-foot facility, dubbed the Flower Mine, is owned and operated by Phoenix-based MSO, the Flower Shop, and produces 31,000 pounds of flour annually. The company has been lauded for bringing jobs back to the community, for drilling its own wells, and for using a new technology to capture and reuse 75% of its water, which is always an issue in the desert. 
Phoenix-based Tilt Holdings recently announced that D'Angela Dia Sims stepped down from its board of directors to focus on her own business. Her seat was filled by Arthur Art Smuck, a supply chain expert who previously served as COO of Herbal and CEO of FedEx Supply Chain. As for new and noteworthy products now available in Arizona, Payson-based Ally Biotech recently debuted Chill Pills with a Z, which are THC and THC plus CBD soft gels to give consumers an alternate method of consumption. The line includes sativa, indica, and hybrid products sold as day caps, night caps, and anytime caps. California-based 22 Red recently launched four new strains in Arizona, Cherry on Top, Grape Stomper, Hippie Crasher, and Papaya Punch. They and other 22 Red products are available at over 20 locations in the state. Here are some upcoming cannabis social events around Arizona. The Lion's Den Bar and Grill in the Pine Top Lakeside area is hosting its second annual weekend in the Pines featuring live music and designated smoking areas the evenings of June 23rd and 24th. Elevated Wellness's monthly BYOC yoga class is June 23rd in Cave Creek, Arizona. Trap Culture's June Trap Night, a monthly cannabis-friendly nightclub event, is on June 24th at the Soho Lounge in Mesa. And Hempful Farms is hosting a three-hour puff and paint session July 8th. Two upcoming cannabis business events are the Drops with a Z and Meet a Monthly Networking Meeting. Drops is June 23rd in Tucson, and Meta is June 28th in Scottsdale. That will do it for this week's Arizona Cannabis Report. I'm Karen Black from Greenfinger Consulting, reporting for Weed Talk News. In the Keystone state of Pennsylvania, there's a movement to improve their hemp market while rezoning could put existing medical dispensaries in danger of losing out on a future adult use market. Here's Claudia Post with the Pennsylvania Cannabis Report. I'm Claudia Post from Scarlet Express, and I'm here in the Keystone state of Pennsylvania reporting for Weed Talk News. If new zoning rules proposed by Philadelphia City Councilman Brian O'Neill are approved in the coming months, Several medical marijuana dispensaries across Northeast Philadelphia will be cut out of the future recreational market. Unbelievable what they're doing to tear up business. Councilman O'Neill introduced a bill to amend two zoning overlay districts to prohibit the sale of recreational marijuana. There are already three medical marijuana dispensaries operating in the area. A third zoning overlay in Philadelphia, says Councilman Curtis Jones, along City Line Avenue, was included in the proposed ban. This legislation is disappointing because legal medical marijuana operators spent millions on building their dispensaries and investing in heightened security measures. Businesses have already signed leases, some of upwards to 10 years with landlords. And of course, I have to make a comment about every state, including working heavily in New Jersey. This is what they're doing. They're making it so onerous and so difficult for us to stand up in the industry. And I I don't understand why, because there's, there's money for everyone, employment for everyone. Anyway, enough of my rant for today. Pennsylvania's agriculture secretary announced on Thursday that the state will be distributing nearly $400,000 in matched funding to promote the hemp market, including by creating a curriculum to teach high school and college students about the many uses of the cannabis plant. And I think I said before that Pennsylvania, way back in the 1700s, was the largest producer of hemp. The bulk of the grant funds will support the student initiative with money being used to create a STEM, that's science, technology, engineering, and math curriculum, to effectively engage in industrial hemp production, management, and cultivation by producing and promoting and marketing industrial hemp for its many uses, such as food, fiber, fuel, industrial, and personal care products. 
the Pennsylvania Departments of Agriculture and Education previously announced in 2020 that K through 12 students will be learning about how to make sustainable plastic using hemp. One of the grants will go towards the U.S. Ecological Advanced Research and Conservation Hub Hemp Certificate for Disadvantaged Communities. It is called on to develop an educational program for disadvantaged communities, including youth, veterans, and women to enable them to get involved in the hemp industry. Pennsylvania has been making history, building a new hemp industry from its roots up, said Russell Redding, the agriculture se sir, secretary. Sorry. These grants feed the growth of an industry that once a staple in Pennsylvania common economy and now is now once again growing opportunities for new businesses, farm income jobs, and climate smart, environmentally sound products. Pennsylvania has been making history building a new hemp industry from its roots up. These grants feed the growth of an industry, as I said, which was once a staple of Pennsylvania's economy and is once again growing opportunities for businesses, farms, jobs, and climate smart, environmentally sound products. Well, that's a wrap from Pennsylvania. I'm Claudia Post from Scarlet Express to talk about what's hot and what's not in Pennsylvania from We Talk News. Have a fabulous week and thank you. Over the past year, legalization of adult use and sale of cannabis in the South American country of Colombia has gained quite a bit of momentum. So much so that a vote was taken in their Senate this week that got a majority, a majority of votes to pass a legalization bill. Now, unfortunately, according to Colombian law and a constitution, you have to have a super majority for a constitutional amendment to be added, added that is. And a bill of this magnitude that includes that constitutional amendment has to happen. So it failed to pass by eight votes. Well, now that whole process has to start all over again in Colombia. You don't think that the drug cartels in that country might be trying to keep things just the way they are? Just thinking. Anyway, now let's turn to our international scene with our European correspondent, Lex Pelger. Hello, everyone. I'm Lex Pelger from Whitewell Creation with this week's European Cannabis Report for Weed Talk News. In Europe this week, everybody is waiting on Germany. Because being the largest economy in Europe means that everybody pays attention to you. For instance, in the Czech Republic, the health minister Vlastimil Velik has cast doubts on the country's ambitious plans to roll out an adult-use cannabis market by 2024. He said that he's waiting for Germany to reveal the draft of their adult-use cannabis laws and to see how the European Commission responds to that proposal. In contrast, the Czech Republic's anti-drug coordinator Gingrich Voboril, sometimes called the locomotive driving the reform, wants to push ahead with the country's new cannabis laws. The proposed regulations would include a paid license for the cannabis market that is reasonably priced, the ability of pharmacies to sell cannabis without paying a fee, and for citizens to cultivate up to three square meters for personal use. Voboril has said that he is not deterred by Germany's scaled-back plan or the threat of European Commission pushback because he doesn't think they'll do anything. Another watcher of Germany is her small neighbor Luxembourg. The country initially planned to have a chain of 14 state-run dispensaries, but after the EU told Germany that if they did something similar, it wouldn't conform to EU law, Luxembourg decided to change its plans. The hope now is that the government will at least pass plans for self-cultivation and private consumption before elections in October. Finally, here in France, two pieces of news. First, the country instituted a ban on HHC, hexahydrocannabinol, as well as two sister molecules, HHCO and HHCP. With structures and effects similar to THC, Products containing these psychoactive cannabinoids have been popular at CBD shops. Too popular. So the country's health minister decided to join a number of other EU countries to ban them in the name of fighting addiction. Meanwhile, on the other side of the spectrum, the town of Begle, located just on the other side of the city here in Bordeaux, the mayor sent a letter to President Macron proposing to make his town a testing ground for the supervised sale of cannabis. Mayor Clément Razugnal Pouesh says he is motivated by several objectives, including the reduction of trafficking and its associated violence, relieving congestion in the judicial, judicial system, curbing consumption by young people, and the economic contributions to the agricultural sector. With Begle being the first town to ever marry a gay couple, this cannabis proposal keeps him at the forefront of French progressive movements. 
That's the European Cannabis Report for this week. For more on the science side, see my newsletter on Substack, Cannabinoids and the People. I'm Lex Pelger from Whitewell Creations reporting for Weed Talk News. A vicious editorial in the New York Post ripped that state's embarrassing rollout of the legal adult use market. Now, I recognize that there's a big difference between an opinion piece in the Post and the New York Times. But the Post view that the state's rollout effort has, quote, gone up in smoke. It's pretty accurate, don't you think? The promises from state politicians that this new industry can produce billions of tax revenue has been a failure on many fronts and for many reasons. Pam Schmiel is our New York correspondent, and she has our weekly cannabis report from the Big Apple. I'm Pam Schmiel, host of the Mary Jane Society podcast with the New York Cannabis Report for Weed Talk News. New York Governor Hochul held a press conference yesterday to announce increased enforcement to shut down hundreds of unlicensed cannabis shops in New York City. She's threatening to fine the stores up to $20,000 a day in some cases, and she's going after the landlords too. And as cannabis farmers, manufacturers, and dispensary owners in New York try to navigate the painfully slow rollout of the cannabis industry, they are moving full steam ahead with their business plans. They all gathered at at an old factory in a small town in upstate New York yesterday for a new trade show called the Revelry Buyers Club. It was founded by two people who have been organizing cannabis meetups in New York City since 2016. The event brought together New York farmers, brands, and dispensary owners to meet each other and to do business together, where farmers showed off their craft cannabis flower, manufacturers flaunted their handcrafted gummies, and extractors elaborated on their terpene formulations. The industry's success depends on these people coming together to supply cannabis to the general public. And I can report that I witnessed grit and hustle at this event. These entrepreneurs are using blood, sweat, and tears to get the cannabis industry off the ground, and they could use help from our state government. That's this week's New York City Cannabis Report. I'm Pam Schmiel, reporting for Weed Talk News. Delaware may be one of the smallest states in the union, but they are also starting their legal adult use market now. Needless to say, it takes time to set up all the regulations and compliance requirements. So this week, that state named a former law enforcement superintendent to head up the regulatory board. His name is Robert Koop, and for 27 years, he worked for the Delaware State Police and then moved on to corrections and homeland security. Now, his nomination passed unanimously in that state's Senate. Now it's time to check the stock market with Doug Miller, who is high on Wall Street. I'm Doug Miller from High on Wall Street with this week's Cannabis Stock Report for Weed Talk News. Terra Sen won conditional approval to be listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange, the TSX. This is the first for a company with plant-touching operations in the U.S. where marijuana remains federally illegal. The TSX still must give the company final approval, but if the exchange does sign off, It could open the doors for other MSOs to tap into a larger pool of investors on the TSX. Terrasen was trading around $1.70, and the stock chart's starting to look good. I would watch for dips, but I'm expecting it to start moving soon. And that's this week's Cannabis Stock Report reporting for Weed Talk News. I'm Doug Miller. Now that fine fettle in Newington became the first adult use dispensary in Connecticut to open, there will be many more to follow. And the the nutmeg state in Connecticut, that's what they call it, of course, they can now start to collect those valuable tax dollars. Angie Seifert is our correspondent down there. And here's this week's Connecticut Cannabis Report. Hi, I'm Angie from Skip Intro Advisors with the Connecticut Cannabis Report for Weed Talk News. New Haven's first cannabis dispensary and retailer, Affinity Dispensary, is looking to move to a new location to replace a long-standing diner of 36 years near I-91, which will total almost 5,000 square feet, 
with both medical and adult use. Recently, Massachusetts-based company INSA signed a 10-year lease to be the city's second cannabis operator and will convert the former site of Long Island Wharf Theater into a dispensary. Now, TrueLeave earlier expressed interest in New Haven, but later withdrew the application to focus their efforts on the South. These expansions are supporting the idea that demand for the product and the experience is on a positive path in Connecticut and dispensaries here are seeking to impress and retain consumers. Now, secondly, Stanford, Connecticut has collected almost 77,500,000 dollars in tax revenue so far from its two hybrid cannabis retailers. Now, uh, Stanford started selling, or Connecticut, excuse me, started selling in January. So the money will be used to support projects to absorb the flooding in Stanford's downtown residential area. Now, state law requires that municipalities put their cannabis sales tax revenue towards streetscape improvements, yes. Now, also education or youth employment programs, juvenile review boards, mental health, addiction services, and services for people released from prison. In the city's budget, officials project that Stanford will collect 500,000 in tax revenue during the fiscal year 23 to 24. So while Stanford is only operating two dispensaries currently, the projection for tax revenue is within reach and could also benefit the people in addition to the landscape in the town. Now that's Connecticut Cannabis News Report for this week. I'm Angie Seifert from Skip Intro Advisors reporting for Weed Talk News. The growing pains in Illinois cannabis market continue and May saw sales decline. And there's more fallout from the social equity world. Thomas Howard from Cannabis Legalization News is our correspondent out there. And here's his Illinois cannabis report for this week. What's up? It's me, Tom, from Cannabis Legalization News, here with the Illinois Report for Weed Talk News. Uh, there's not much to report out of Illinois. Uh, the litigation for the super case of all the craft grow licenses that's slowly moving its way forward through a meet and confer process, as they're calling it. Uh, there's been no update regarding the 55 dispensary uh, license lottery that will be happening sometime in 2023. Everybody who made it in got an email about three weeks ago saying they were reviewing the applicants in the, in the lottery and they would get back to us, which will be sometime soon. The legislature in Illinois has also adjourned, didn't pass anything except for IRC 280E uh, reform. So now, at least at the Illinois state level, the dispensaries are not being double taxed. Hmm. And other than that, uh, more dispensaries are slowly opening. I want to say 26 out of the 192 social equity dispensaries are now open in the state of Illinois, bringing our grand total of dispensaries up to about 136, I believe. And with that, I really don't have much more to report. Tune in to Canvas Legalization News on YouTube on Sundays, and I will see you when it is 420 somewhere. And now back to Jimmy in the studio. Now it's time for an abbreviated Massachusetts Cannabis Report, now sponsored by CNA Stores in Amesbury and Haverhill. Two friends of pro-cannabis media, Stephen Mandilli and Dr. Marion McNabb, presented the findings of her cannabis research on veterans at the State House this week. You see, there's a bill there sponsored by House Rep. Michael Sotor and Senator Ryan Fatman that will make it easier for veterans to get their medical marijuana cards for the state and at no charge. Now, if you don't know that our veterans do not have access to medicinal cannabis at the VA, nor can they be recommended that as a treatment for many of the ills that our veterans bring home with them. That bill will receive a hearing next week. At least the state is trying to get it right, right, for the veterans. It looks like there's no money, however, for the social equity applicants. That social equity account reserved for those most impacted by the failed war on drugs is an opportunity to get into the cannabis business. But there's no access to it, and there's no money in that account. The, this story will continue. And finally, if you are at Fenway Park over this weekend, you might see Bertha the bus. If you're a Grateful Dead fan, you know that's the Garcia brand bus that drives around from show to show, spreading the word, according to Jerry Garcia, and bringing attention to the brand and the cause. Well, anyway, that's the Massachusetts Cannabis Report this week, sponsored by CNA Stores. 
The Massachusetts Cannabis Report on We Talk News is supported by CNA Stores, a veteran-owned and family-operated cannabis dispensary with two locations in Amesbury and in Haverhill, dedicated to the community north of Boston and to consumers by providing the widest selection of products in the state. One of the most popular cannabis advocates in the country is Jim Belushi, the actor and the grower of cannabis in Oregon, plus the musician with the Blues Brothers. Now, last week, one of his Blues Brothers buddies, his brother, Dan Aykroyd, tweeted out that Jim would have a great career in politics. So that could be a possibility. And now he wants to hear from the public about whether or not he should run for a Senate position. Now, I know it will certainly be an improvement over some of the representatives in Washington, D.C. Good luck, Jim. That's We Talk News for this week. We'll be back on July 14th. Until then, remember, it's a whole new world of weed out there. Use it responsibly. It's a whole new world of weed out there, isn't it? Everyone is learning new ways to titrate, ingest, consume, imbibe, and engage with this plant medicine we call cannabis. Hi, I'm Jimmy Young, the founder of Pro Cannabis Media and the host of In the Weeds. And once in a while, the really live business cannabis talk show we call Green Rush on Friday afternoons from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern. I've been a medical patient in Massachusetts for almost 10 years now. I remember my first trip to a dispensary just outside of Boston, and I told the bud tender I didn't want to smoke it anymore. So I tried edibles, then tinctures, then vaping. And now if I'm going to smoke, I only use the Weejits filtration system. What? The Weejits.com, Weejits, that's weed, W-E-E-D, G-E-T-S.com, is where you'll find the planet's coolest product. Both cool the smoke from 1,300 degrees to just 90 into your lungs. Plus, the maze pipe and pre-roll filters get rid of all the gunk that you just don't want in your lungs if you can help it. Add in the code of PCMTV and you get 15% off. So just go to Weejits.com and check out the best way to enjoy a cooler smoke with less coughing and hacking and more peace of mind. All that resin and tar is collected in the polyurethane filters that are easy to clean with soap, water, and a few Q-tips. Your lungs will thank you and so will I. We are a cultivation through to consumption lifestyle brand for the cannabis industry. Of course, the crown jewel in our product line is the armoire home grow system. So now with Green Goddess Supply, we can take you everywhere from growing it in the armoire right through to storing it, consuming it, rolling it, storing it, you name it, A to Z. Our goal is to enable everybody and anybody anywhere to be able to produce their own organic flower quickly, easily, discreetly, and inexpensively. You would think that it is. However, there's quite a bit of debate right now in the accounting industry when it relates to cannabis with this exact question. Um, I'm part of a few different networking groups that are solely accountants for cannabis companies. And there's been quite a bit of back and forth in those communities and discussion regarding whether 280E, if it went away, if the administration legalized cannabis or took it off of schedule one, what would happen? And it could go either way right now. The debate is it can make the accountant's life much easier. Uh, That's what a lot of the inexperienced accountants are saying right now, it seems. Whereas the accountants that have been in this industry for a while and and have gone through the same thing that happened with hemp a few years ago are saying that it'll actually will make lives more difficult because when hemp became declassified a while back, the accounting became more complicated.
Sativa Labs in Westfield is fast becoming the number one testing lab for cannabis in Western Massachusetts. Sativa understands the importance for accurate on-time test results for your product. That's why their current compliance panel turnaround time is less than two days. That's Sativa Labs in Westfield. For more information, go to safetiva.com. The Vermont Cannabis Report is supported by another Green Mountain business, Canatrol, winner of High Times Best Dry Cure System. Check them out at canatrols.com.